Well, hello and welcome to the OHA Year Two Workup Series. My name is James, the president of Operation Heal America, a kingdom company dedicated to unleashing spiritual healing and revival from our house to the White House through obedience to 2 Chronicles 7.14 for the advancement of God's kingdom and the magnification of his glory worldwide. This is this video is the fifth in a series that I pray is going to ignite the fires of revival and encourage all of us as we move towards our OHA year two start date of January 1st, 2023. If you missed year one, you definitely want to check out the earlier videos that cover year one in its, in its entirety through our YouTube channel, which you can access directly or through our website, OperationHealAmerica.com. And you definitely, if you missed the first four videos or any of the four videos, Videos prior to this one, you definitely want to check them out as it will give full context to this particular video. And I would encourage you to check them out more than once. I'm really excited about this particular video. It's a little bit longer than normal, but I trust and pray that it's going to bless you and really help you understand how Satan orchestrates the great role reversal with every institution from our house to the White House. So the purpose of this workup series is to get pastors, churches, believers in Jesus Christ prepared to successfully execute year two of OHA. Again, the first ever frontline national plan centered on 2 Chronicles 7, 14, dedicated dedicated to unleashing spiritual healing and revival from our house to the White House. We can't fully address the solution found in 2 Chronicles 7.14 until we fully address the problem, and that is what this series is designed for. In this video, you're going to learn how the Holy Spirit used the blue angels to illustrate what our family formations are supposed to look like. We're going to learn what it looks like when we're out of our lanes with God and one another, the nine ways that Satan orchestrates the great role reversal, and finally, the 10 devastating consequences of the great role reversal from our house to the White House. Are you ready? Let's get into it. So years ago, I used to live in military base housing aboard Naval Air Station Pensacola or NAS Pensacola in none other than Pensacola, Florida, home to the world famous Blue Angels Flight Demonstration Team, founded in 1946. Affectionately known as the Blues, they are the second oldest formal flying aerobatic team in the world after the French Petit de France formed in 1931. I was a lieutenant or 03 at the time teaching ground school to Navy, Marine Corps and Coast Guard flight students, which included introductory courses in aerodynamics and in meteorology. This, however, was not my first assignment in Pensacola. I'd been a flight student there about four years earlier. Thus, I'd become quite accustomed to seeing the blue zoom by in their FA-18 Hornets and hearing the unmistakable sound of those twin GE F404 turbofan engines. To this day, few things stir me as deeply as the sight and sound of the Blue Angels. I had the pleasure of witnessing the blues in action, however, even before flight school. I was incredibly blessed to have them commence graduation ceremonies for my class at the United States Naval Academy with a precision flyby in perfect Delta formation. That's all six planes above the Navy Marine Corps Memorial Stadium in Annapolis, Maryland. While learning to land a helicopter at night on the flight deck of a pitching and rolling frigate or destroyer as a former Navy helicopter pilot myself, certainly that requires a certain skill set. It doesn't, in my opinion, compare in any way to the skill set needed to fly the ball, i.e. maintain a proper angle of attack during descent for landing and hit the wire, i.e. grab a cable stretched tightly across the flight deck with a tail hook of the aircraft at night at approximately 160 miles per hour. Though many of my fellow helicopter buddies or bubbas as we're affectionately called, might jokingly disagree and do, and others be unwilling to face the music and are, flying jets requires a far superior skill set because everything happens so much more quickly. Margins of error are smaller and less forgiving and jets with few notable exceptions 
i.e. the V-22 Osprey, the AV-8B Harrier, and the F-35B Lightning II, do not have the luxury of reducing their ground speed to zero, i.e. pulling into a hover before landing. However, this aside, what is unique about Navy flight training is that every Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard pilot goes through the exact same primary flight training syllabus, known as primary, as every Blue Angel pilot did on their way to becoming a Blue. During primary, every Navy student pilot is required to fly a series of precision aerobatic flights and then a series of formation flights after their first solo. This inescapable, stressful, and thrilling opportunity allows each student pilot to get a taste of what it's like to fly in formation with other aircraft before they actually have to do it in the fleet. The squadron I was assigned to was known as the Lamplighters. There's the patch. Did God have my number or what? While the fundamentals of flying and formation in the T-34C mentor during primary or in a helicopter are the same fundamentals employed by the Blue Angels, employing them at 120 knots or less with one or two other aircraft requiring small course corrections is very different than employing them at air speeds of up to 400 knots with five other aircraft while doing aerobatics. The Blue Blues are truly amazing. If you've never seen them at a live air show, I highly recommend putting it on your bucket list today. Even after all these years, whenever I see the blues, I am immediately flooded with feelings of patriotism and gratitude to those who fought and continue to fight to secure our liberties and freedoms that you and I enjoy. And if you're like me, so often take for granted. Regardless of what's going on in my life, when I witnessed the Blues' astonishing display of power, command presence, expert precision, unrivaled self-control, unparalleled unity, and unwavering commitment to excellence, I know that God is still large and in charge of my life and world events. Simply put, whenever I witnessed the Blues' jaw-dropping beauty, elegance, and grace, it is well with my soul. Spontaneous reactions I've had to the blues over the years, as corny as this may sound, have included shouts of yes, silent prayers, singing of the national anthem, or just standing at attention as my eyes fill with tears. Regardless of my reaction, one dominating thought always flooded my mind then and now. This is the way it's supposed to be. While some of you may not be able to relate to how deeply the blues affect me, others of you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's how you feel after seeing a well-executed play in the NFL or NBA, or how you feel after taking that first bite of your favorite entree at your favorite restaurant. Or it's how you feel when you drive a well-engineered automobile. Or it's how you feel when you listen to your favorite songs, play 18 holes on your favorite golf course, or when some of you ladies get your hair done at at your favorite salon or find the perfect outfit with the perfect pair of shoes to match. Have you ever said to yourself, now this is the way it's supposed to be. Okay, now you know what I'm talking about with respect to the blues. While this should come as no surprise, Blue Angel pilots are among the Navy and Marine Corps' finest pilots who get nominated and selected from among the best jet pilots in the aircraft carrier community. Said another way, the Blue Angels are in the military aviation world what SEAL Team 6 is in the spec ops world. The very best of the best. Yes, I'm admittedly a little bit biased. During my research, I came across what is commonly known to every Blue Angel as the Blue Angel Creed, written by J01 Kathy Kahn between 1991 and 1993, which is spoken over every new blue. It goes as follows. Today is a very special and memorial day, memorable day in your military career that will remain with you throughout your lifetime. <clears throat> You have survived the ultimate test of your peers and have proven to be completely deserving to wear the crest of the U.S. Navy Blue Angels. The prestige of wearing the Blue Angels uniform carries, carries with it an extraordinary honor, one that reflects not only on you as an individual, 
but on your teammates and the entire squadron. To the crowds at the air shows and to the public at hospitals and schools nationwide, you are a symbol of the Navy and Marine Corps' finest. You bring pride, hope, and a promise for tomorrow's Navy and Marine Corps in the smiles and handshakes of today's youth. Remember today is the day you became a Blue Angel. Look around at your teammates and commit this special bond to memory. Once a Blue Angel, always a Blue Angel rings true for all those who wear the crest of the U.S. Navy Blue Angels. Welcome to the team. As stated in the Blue Angel Creed, every Blue Angel understands that their actions or inaction not only affect them individually, but also affect every member of the team. Each Blue, like a professional athlete, also understands that their reputation is always on display for the world to see whether they want it to be or not. Furthermore, they know that one serious lapse of judgment can not only affect them and the other blues for the rest of their lives, but how the public perceives the blues for the rest of their lives. The blues thus take their jobs seriously both on and off the quote field because they know they represent something greater than themselves to present and future generations. During their air shows, it's commonly understood that the Blues, quote, own the airfield and the airspace where they happen to be operating. All six demonstration aircraft may be seen together during taxi, takeoff, and of course, when flying together in formation. The Blues fly two different formations, the famous diamond formation consisting of four planes, Blue Angels numbers one through four, and the stunning Delta formation consisting of all six demonstration aircraft. I will primarily focus on the Delta formation hereafter referred to as the Delta during my remaining discussion. Though each of the six Blue Angel demonstration pilots in the Delta is equally valuable, each member has their own function. For those of you who go bowling or may be familiar with the numbering system of the 10 bowling pins when in formation, when the Blue Angels are in the Delta, they are numerically positioned the same way as the first six bowling pins on the bowling alley. The only exception is that Blue Angel number four, pin number four, and Blue Angel number five, pin number five, switch positions in the formation. Thus, Blue Angel numbers one, three, and five fly the left side of the delta, and Blue Angels numbers one, two, and six fly the right side of the delta, with Blue Angel number four in between Blue Angel number five and Blue Angel number six. Got it? Blue Angel number one, or bowling pin number one in formation, is the commanding officer or flight leader of the Blues. To the rest of the team, however, he's affectionately known as the boss. Not surprisingly, he's the most senior member of the team responsible for the overall leadership, training, safety, and guidance of the team. To be considered for the position of boss, pilots must have a minimum of 3,000 tactical jet flight hours and must have been a former commanding officer or CO of a tactical jet squadron. As the senior member of the Blues, the boss calls all the shots directly or indirectly through delegated authority to the other blues on the team. Like a caller singing out the steps at a square dance, the boss methodically tells the other pilots in the Delta everything he's about to do just before he does it. Then on the next radio call, he and Blue Angels number two through six simultaneously execute his instructions. When he speaks, they follow him. Why? Because they know his voice. As the flight leader, the boss is ultimately responsible for not only leading the other blues, but also protecting them against things like excessive fatigue, bad weather, and other flight hazards. The boss is usually a Navy commander or 05, but it's not common for him to make captain or 06 while on assignment. While he may be the one in charge in formation, it is common knowledge by every member of the Blues that he operates under the authority of a bigger boss, if you will, known as the Chief of Naval Operations or CNO. The CNO in turn operates under the authority of the biggest boss, 
the commander in chief or president of the United States. In other words, everyone knows that everyone on the team is under authority. Said another way, the boss is under the CNO. Blue Angels numbers two through six are under the boss and the CNO is under the commander in chief. Thus the job of every boss is to follow the CNO while the job of every boss or every blue is to follow the boss. Said another way, while Blue Angel number one, hereafter referred to as number one, is in charge and ultimately responsible for every aspect of the blues, he knows he is operating under a higher authority at all times. This higher authority determines based upon how well the boss fulfills his duties and responsibilities, whether the boss will complete his tour of assignment or be relieved of duty for cause. Thus, the boss understands that while he has great freedom, this freedom comes with great responsibility that is restricted to and governed by the provisions and guidelines of the CNO. In addition to these requirements, the boss also understands that he and his blues are bound by the limitations of the Naval Air Training and Operating Procedure Standardization or NATOPS manual for the FA-18 Hornet. In fact, the cover of every NATOPS manual says that it is issued, quote, by authority of the Chief of Naval Operations and under the direction of the Command Naval Air Systems Command. The NATOPS manual, which exists for all naval aircraft, is affectionately referred to as the pilot's Bible. Seriously, no kidding. It's also common knowledge by every naval aviator that every NATOPS manual was written in blood from the lessons learned from those who lost their lives so others wouldn't have to. Wow, it kind of sounds like the Holy Bible in our Jesus, doesn't it? While some of the sections of NATOPS vary depending upon the type of aircraft and its respective mission, two standard sections found in every NATOPS manual are the operating limitations and emergency procedures. In the operating limitations section of NATOPS, engine, airspeed, weight, and angle of attack limitations are discussed, among many other limitations, as well as prohibited maneuvers for that particular aircraft type. The emergencies procedures section of NATOPS, as one might expect, lists step-by-step -step procedures to employ during every conceivable ground or in-flight emergency encountered by that aircraft type. The correct application of emergency procedures requires every pilot to have an in-depth knowledge of every system in their aircraft, including but not limited to the power plant, fuel, flight performance, electrical lighting, oxygen, hydraulic, flight control, avionics, and landing gear systems. The consequences of not operating within the boundaries and limitations of NATOPS can be fatal. Said another way, operating outside of NATOPS can result to damage to the aircraft, seriously bod serious bodily injury, or even death. To meet the minimum flight qualifications, every Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard pilot must pass a NATOPS check ride with a grade of conditionally qualified every year. In other words, they have to continually demonstrate that they can safely and effectively operate their aircraft within the boundaries and limitations of their Bible. Thus, every Blue Angel understands that they are not only operating under the authority of the boss and big boss, or the CNO, but also their Bible or NATOPS manual. While the Blues have great freedom, each Blue understands that their freedom is limited to the boundaries set forth by their boss, big boss, and the NATOPS manual. Let's now take a look at the boss's role a little more closely. The boss's role involves detailed planning, instruction, training, guidance, correction, and lots of practice and communications to ensure that the boss brings as much glory as possible to the big boss or CNO. The boss's attention to detail ensures to the greatest extent possible that each team member of the Blues properly executes their roles and responsibilities correctly and under authority. While the boss extends grace to team members who are learning new maneuvers 
or fine tuning their skills and precision on existing maneuvers, there is zero tolerance for any pilot who operates outside of their function or who usurps the boss's authority in any way. Needless to say, the boss is not a passive individual when it comes to his role and responsibilities, knowing that abdication of them could be fatal to the team. Unlike Adam, a good boss makes things happen. He doesn't watch things happen or say, what happened? Additionally, a good boss knows what's going on in formation, good and bad at all times. For example, when it's time for specific team members to conduct solo maneuvers, it's the boss who authorizes breakaways from the Delta for that purpose. The boss also authorizes join ups once solo maneuvers are complete. No one in formation acts independently of the boss and he expects nothing less. Every good boss is also a nice balance of grace and truth. He knows that too much grace can lower the standards and expectations while too much truth can take the joy out of flying. So even when things don't go well and correction is necessary, the boss has a beautiful way of extending grace without lowering the standards of the big boss. Maintaining these standards of excellence while giving the blues a freedom to fail communicates to every blue just how valuable they are and how much they are needed, accepted, and loved by the boss. A good boss is a joy to follow and blues who understand their roles are a joy to lead. Now let's take a look at the other blues. Blue angel number two, hereafter referred to as number two, is known as the right wing or the boss's right wingman. The right wingman's job is to support the boss at all times. While the boss has two wingmen, she, number two, is his primary wingman. Next to the boss, the boss's greatest loyalty and allegiance is to number two. She watches his back. She watches the back of her boss in formation and stays functionally behind, underneath, and to his right to help him complete the big boss's mission. In combat, the big boss, boss, and number two understand that the boss and number two have more firepower, better situational awareness, and a superior ability to employ dynamic tactics against the enemy together than they each have on their own. Blue Angel number two maintains her proper place in formation behind and underneath the boss by maintaining the same sight picture she sees when she lines up the leading edge or the front part of her wing of her left wing with the nearest part of the boss's aircraft. She maintains this relative position to the boss at all times by making continuous adjustments to her airspeed and flight path. Every time a boss and his primary wingman or number two begin a relationship, boss and number two practice what I just described over and over until they are literally flying as one. Then and only then can the rest of the blues assume their proper positions behind them in formation. The boss is in constant communications with number two so that no, number two knows what number one is going to do before number one does it to make it easier for number two to follow him. Blue Angel number two similarly is in constant communications with number one so that number one knows that number two heard what number one just told her and is ready to execute his instructions. Because there is a trusted history, sense of loyalty and duty, and a keen understanding and adherence to their specific roles and responsibilities, number two knows that number one will never leave her, number two. Additionally, number one trusts that number two will stay in formation behind and underneath him at all times for the benefit of the entire formation. And even when number two gets out of position ever so slightly, number one has complete confidence that she will make whatever course corrections are necessary to get back in her lane because she knows her role and understands what's at stake. 
Therefore, every number two is happy to submit to number one's authority because she knows he is responsible for her and will do his best to protect her and provide for her the necessary leadership, provision, and guidance that she needs to be safe and successful. Though there are five other aircraft in the Delta, number two only takes instructions from and follows the movements of the boss to maintain a proper position behind him in the Delta. And number one expects nothing less since the ability of Blue Angel number six to maintain his position behind and underneath number two in the Delta is dependent on number two's ability to maintain her position behind and underneath the boss. Blue Angel number th three, hereafter referred to as number three, is known as the left wing or number one's left wingman. Number three does on the left side of the formation behind and underneath one what number two does on the right side of the formation behind and underneath number one. Everything stated between number one and number two above applies equally between number one and number three, except that the relationship between number one and three is junior to the relationship between number one and number two as outlined above. The relationship between number one and number three, however, is still critical to the success of the team since the ability of Blue Angel number five to maintain her proper position in the delta behind and underneath number three is dependent on number three's ability to maintain their proper position behind and underneath number one. Flying Blue Angel number four, hereafter referred to as number four, behind and underneath one, two, and three is the slot. The slot pilot is the boss's designated safety officer because of the slot pilot's unique position in formation that enables him to see all the other blues in formation. One Blue Angel pilot slot had this to say about his role. Number four has to have the big picture. He keeps an eye on weather, emergency field status, fuel, altitude, and airspeed. He can even call for more room between wingtips or advise the boss to increase the roll rate. Everyone depends on you. Everyone depends on you for backup. One boss had this to say about his slot. Number four sets the formation and has to be rock solid. He's a safety valve between me. However, just like number two and number three, number four's job is to stay focused on number one's every movement to maintain his proper alignment behind and underneath the boss in formation at all times. Again, the boss expects nothing less. Flying Blue Angel number five, hereafter referred to as number five, is the lead solo position to the left, behind, and underneath the left wing or number three. The job of the lead solo is to demonstrate what the F-18 Hornet is capable of doing. One lead solo said the following. We bring in the low, the fast, the loud, and the vertical maneuvers. The lead solo is responsible for adjusting the solo's timing to offset the formation during an air show. This minimizes dead space during the performance and keeps the pilot safe. Everything stated above between number one and number three applies equally between number three and number five. And number one expects nothing less knowing this, that the success of number five depends on the success of number three, which depends on the success of number one. Flying Blue Angel number six, hereafter referred to as number six, is the opposing solo position to the right behind and underneath number two. The job of the opposing solo is identical to number five, but on the opposite side of the formation, hence the name. Everything stated above between number one and number two applies equally between number two and number six. And number one expects nothing less, knowing that the success of number six depends on the success of number two, which depends on the success of number one. Are you starting to see a pattern here? 
As mentioned earlier, lead solo number five and opposing solo number six are not authorized to commence breakaways from the Delta for solo maneuvers without prior authorization from the boss. All unauthorized breakaways are subject to immediate disciplinary action. Among the many fascinating discoveries about the blues in doing my research was realizing that their functional names and formation are also what they go by even when they are not flying. For example, Blue Angel number four is never introduced to the public as just Blue Angel number four. His function is always included during his introduction, which goes like this. Flying Blue Angel number four, the slot pilot from city, state, rank, and name. Thus, each Blue Angel is known by their function they serve in formation, whether they're flying or not. Why? because it's who they are. The tour of duty for each Blue Angel pilot is typically two years. However, the two year period begins and ends at different times for different blues. So they're not too many new blues beginning at once or too many senior blues leaving at once. This rotation allows the blues to maintain much continuity and seniority as possible at all times. After the first year, a team flies together, some of the demonstration pilots get promoted into more senior assignments within the Blues formation, while certain section leaders rotate out. For example, posing solo number six moves up into the lead solo number five position and becomes responsible for training the new number six. Another significant jump that occurs within the formation is that the left wing, number three, moves into the slot position or number four position and trains the new left wing, number three. Only the right wing or number two remains in her position for the entire two years. And number one expects nothing less. As stated earlier, their relationship is very special and the rest of the blues know it and wouldn't have it any other way. Like a fantastic band that makes a lead singer sound better than he really is. When all the blues are properly aligned behind and underneath the boss in formation, they make the boss look better than he is. And when the boss looks good, the big boss looks good. Said another way, when everyone is operating under authority in their lanes as established within the guidelines established by the CNO and NATOPS, or the Bible, right? Everyone makes the big boss look good. However, the opposite is also true. When just one blue is out of their lane, not only does it make the big boss look bad, but it makes the whole team look bad, especially in the eyes of those who look to them for hope in present and future generations. Such an out of order blue can quickly find themselves grounded if it's determined that their actions posed a threat to the safety, morale, and welfare of the team. The blues sometimes come to within 18 inches of one another while in the delta and diamond formations. It's not common for their wingtips to even overlap. The trust and loyalty that exists between each member of the blues that allows them to fly like this is unprecedented. However, this trust and loyalty can also be a double-edged sword when blues blindly follow a boss who's operating outside the boundaries and limitations of the big boss or natops. Such was the case in 1982 in a tragic incident involving the Thunderbirds or Air Force version of the Blue Angels when they lost four jets and their pilots during a training run known as the Thunderbirds Indian Springs Diamond Crash. In this horrific mishap, while in the diamond formation, the boss experienced a problem with his aircraft that he couldn't recover from in time and flew his plane into the ground. Tragically, the other three pilots followed his lead to their deaths. While many details of this tragic incident are still unknown to date, I share it with you for one primary reason. Every boss loses his authority to lead and have others follow him when he is knowingly or even unknowingly operating outside the boundaries and limitations of his NATOPS manual. 
So why would I go into such detail about the Blue Angels and their amazing Delta formation and discussion about the great role reversal? I'm sure it's obvious by now. It's so you and I would have a powerful and vivid illustration of what a Christ-centered family looks like when everyone's in their lanes, i.e. functioning in their proper roles underneath the authority of the big balls of Jesus and his Natops manual, God's Word or the Bible. You see, every family from God's perspective is in its own family formation where each member, like the boss, has also been given a distinct role subject to the authority of the big boss, Jesus, and his Natops manual, the Bible. Every Christian family that has a husband, father, wife, mom, and children have a big boss, boss, primary wingman, and one or more blues who by God's design function figuratively and spiritually in ways similar to Blue Angels 3 through 6. While this is a far from perfect illustration, there are many striking similarities, as you've seen, between the way the blues operate and the way God expects our families to operate. In case you didn't make all the connections, let me do it for you now. It's worth every bit of repetition so that we never forget it. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In the same way that the big boss, CNO, is the head of every boss or flight leader, the boss is the head of every primary wingman, and the biggest boss, the commander-in-chief, is the head of every big boss or CNO. Christ is the head of every man. Or husband, the husband is the head of his wife, and God is the head of Christ. Everyone is under authority. Like the boss of the Blue Angels, every husband and father has been appointed by the big boss or Jesus to lead his family through the angelic conflict we've been placed in the middle of for the expansion of God's kingdom and glory. Chapter one, boss man, you own the airspace or territory the big boss has given you to execute his flight plan. He expects you to rule it well. The big boss, Jesus, then declared that every wife or primary wingman would follow and operate underneath the authority of her husband or the boss. And that children, Blue Angels 3 through 6 is applicable, would follow and operate underneath the authority of the boss or dad and primary wingman mom. While every husband and father is the God-ordained appointed flight leader of his family, it's common knowledge if he expects his wife and children to follow him, he better be following the big boss, Jesus. Every husband and father, like every boss, thus understands that while he has been given great freedom, his freedom comes with great responsibility that is restricted to and governed by the boundaries and limitations of God's word. Therefore, like the boss of the Blue Angels, the responsibility for provision, protection, and guidance by God's design rests squarely on his shoulders, on the shoulders of the spiritual leader of the family or boss, and his ability to be the kind of leader under Christ that the rest of the family can trust and follow. Also, like the boss of the Blue Angels, the husband's leadership role at home with the help of his wife or primary wingman involves the planning, instruction, training, guidance, correction, and, of course, lots of practice and communications to ensure everyone stays in formation. While the boss or husband and dad extends grace to family members who get out of line, there's zero tolerance for any family member who gets out of formation and refuses to get back in formation. Why? Because pleasing the big boss, Jesus, is of utmost importance to the boss or husband and dad, who will be held accountable by the big boss, Jesus, for how he carried out his leadership's duties and responsibilities. In the same way that the boss's role with the blues is not passive, the role of husband and father at home is not passive. Every boss or husband and father understands that the abdication of his responsibility could be fatal to the survival of his family formation. It is therefore the job of every husband and father, like the boss of the Blue Angels, to make things happen, not watch things happen or simply say, what happened? 
For example, when it's time for certain family members to conduct solo maneuvers, i.e. begin dating, driving, or living on the college campus, the family boss authorizes these breakaways with help from his primary wingman, wife or mom. Now let's look at the similarities between the role of a wife and blue angel number two in the family formation. Functionally behind and underneath the authority of her husband, by God's design, is his primary wingman or wife. Like Blue Angel number two, it's the job of every wife to watch the back of her husband as he leads the family. She does this by staying in formation, functionally behind, underneath, and to the right of her man, thus helping him fulfill the mission the big boss Jesus gave him, using her gifts talents, skills, and abilities. Just like the blues, every flight leader recognized that his wife brings more firepower, better situational awareness, and an improved ability to employ dynamic tactics than he would ever have on his own. Thus, her presence dramatically increases the odds that they will complete God's mission. Similarly, every godly wife, like Blue Angel number two, makes whatever course corrections are necessary to maintain her proper place in the family formation relative to her spiritual leader at all times. Like the boss of the Blue Angels, every family boss or husband stays in constant communications with his wife so that his wife knows what he would like to do before he does it to make it easier for him to follow or easier for her to follow him. Every wife in the primary wingman position is similarly in constant communications with her boss or husband so that he knows she heard him and is ready to respond after providing him her desperately needed input and feedback. Like Blue Angel number one and number two, because there's a trusted history, sense of loyalty and duty, and a keen understanding of their individual functions and responsibilities, every godly wife knows that her husband will never leave her. Moreover, every godly husband knows that he can count on his wife to stay in her lane underneath his authority, even when she doesn't like or agree with the direction he's going. Even when his wife veers slightly off course, her husband, number one, has complete confidence she will make whatever course corrections are necessary to get back in her lane because she knows her role and knows what's at stake. Because the future of God's glory is at stake, every godly wife, like every right wing, knows that to stay correctly aligned under Christ, she must stay properly aligned underneath her man. Thus, she doesn't take instructions from anyone else inside or outside of the formation but him, nor does she follow anyone else's movements but his. Her husband expects nothing less, since the ability of Blue Angel number six, i.e. one of your children, to maintain their proper position in the family and the family formation behind and underneath dad is dependent on her, number two's ability to maintain her proper position behind and underneath dad. Therefore, it's common knowledge in Christ-centered families, as with the Blue Angels, that any wife or primary wingman who can't follow her husband or boss as he follows the big boss, Jesus poses a grave danger to the threat and integrity and survival of the family formation, the success of the mission, and the amount of glory the big boss, Jesus, receives. Now let's take a look at the similarities between the roles of children between the ages of approximate approximately eight and 18. In the family formation and the roles of Blue Angels number three through six in the Delta formation. Symbolically representing Blue Angel number three in the family formation as the left wing would be an older, more mature child in the family. While it's the job of every wife or primary wingman to watch the back of her leader, she can't possibly see every enemy combatant that threatens the family formation. On the other side of the formation given her own blind spots and limitations. Therefore, it is the job of every older, more mature child to help mom watch dad's back from the other side of the formation to ensure the successful completion of the family mission or God's, for God's glory. 
Christ-led families do this by training their older children when they're younger to not only follow dad and mom as they follow Christ, but to get outside of themselves long enough to see and respond to potential threats to other members of the family formation like alcohol, drugs, porn, harmful friends, etc. This is a far cry from the many teenagers who come home from school each day and play video games or hang out on their smartphones and social media accounts for hours or rarely check in with dad, mom, or their siblings to see how they can help or serve the family. Symbolically representing Blue Angel number four in the family formation, assuming other children exist, by delegated authority from dad is a spot typically reserved for the oldest child, ideally a son who receives training from dad to be his safety officer. While everyone knows dad is ultimately responsible for everyone's safety, dad and mom can't possibly see everything going on behind them. Since the slot has the best view of everyone else in the family formation, dad and mom rely on him to help make sure everyone is operating safely within the boundaries and limitations of the family. And giving his oldest son this responsibility, the boss is using his sur super, uh, superb leadership skills to accomplish two essential goals in number four's life. First, if the oldest child is a boy, he is preparing him to be the boss of his own family one day by giving him safety and protection practice. Secondly, dad is multiplying his training efforts by using his oldest child to help him train the child in position number three to be the next safety officer. This frees dad up with mom's help to remain focused on the vision and execution of the family mission while eliminating any safety vacuum that would otherwise exist when the slot breaks away for college or their chosen career. Even with all the responsibility, the oldest child, number four, knows that he can only be successful in this role when he maintains his proper alignment behind and underneath dad's authority. Again, this is a far cry from the many 14 to 18 year olds at home who have to be continually reminded to clean up after themselves, help out around the house, finish their homework, get off their smartphones, stop playing video games, serve others or to get back in their lanes. Even when a daughter must fulfill the slot position due to the age and maturity of the children, it's wise for dad and mom to allow her to do this. Besides satisfying the safety backup requirement needed, her interaction with the boss helps her to know what to look for in her future husband who will lead her one day. Additionally, she gets a front row seat to see how mom, number two, helps dad fulfill the mission God gave him for the family so she'll know exactly what to do when she becomes a primary wingman herself. Symbolically representing Blue Angel number five or the lead solo in the family formation, assuming multiple children would be an older child, but not senior to number three or four. In the same way that the slot has a responsibility of assisting dad and mom in training, guiding, familiarizing, and equipping the younger sibling in position number three for the slot position one day, number five, who just graduated to the number five position from the number six position, has the responsibility to assist number six in assuming their new role. Again, this is all by design. Dad and mom are flying with the long-term view of making sure all their blues know how to be future lovers, leaders, and the followers they need to be in their own family formations one day. The child in position number five, like blue angel number five, is behind and underneath and to the left of number three in the family formation. Even when the boss chooses to put an older child in position number five and in position number three because of number five's responsibility to train number six, it is a strategic and powerful reminder to the rest of the blues of the ongoing need to esteem others higher than themselves. And one guess who taught them this, dad and mom. For years they have watched dad deny himself and fly behind Jesus and mom deny herself and fly behind dad. What a beautiful picture of true submission. Now this is the way 
it's supposed to be. For children in the blue angel number six position where applicable, everything stated between number one, three, and five on the left side of the family formation symbolically applies in number one, two, and six on the right side of the formation. The only thing I would like to say regarding the youngest or newest member of the family formation number six is that dad and mom should not be the only ones praying for them, encouraging them, watching out for them, or helping them stay in their lane. Again, this is a far cry from the average family in America who struggles to have dinner together once a week because everyone is jetting off in their own directions to fly their own missions. Good luck getting people to come to that air show. Like the real boss of the Blue Angels, not only does every family boss expect his blues or children to obey, honor, and show respect for him in the primary wingman, i.e. his wife and mom, but also to one another to promote good order, discipline, peace, unity, and teamwork within the family formation. And woe to the blue or child who doesn't. Whenever media personnel interview a blue following an air show, the blue says what you would expect them to say. It's similar to what a championship athlete says after a big win or what you would expect a member of SEAL Team 6 to say after killing Osama bin Laden. What is it? It goes something like this. What happened today was not the result of one person or even a few, but the direct result of the hard work, dedication, and sacrifice of every member of this team who decided a long time ago that they would be committed to something greater than themselves. Now imagine how differently our marriages, homes, churches, communities, cities, and nation would be if our family formations flew behind Christ with this level of dedication for no other reason but to make the big boss, Jesus, look good. Maybe some of you, after reading this and considering the Blue Angel illustration I provide, are saying, while it would be great if our family looked and operated like this, James, our family's not a military flight demonstration team. Who wants to be part of a family where the boss is barking out orders like a general and everyone has to obey with expert precision or else? I couldn't agree anymore. After all, this is not how the Father leads Christ, how Christ leads men, and how husbands are to lead their wives, or how dads and moms are to lead their children. Nor is it how the boss leads his blues. I would encourage you to watch some of their videos for yourself. It's truly beautiful how the boss leads the blues. I would encourage you to watch some of the videos and see how just masterfully beautiful he leads his blues. However, as countercultural as this may be, God does have a chain of command, beloved. And it's non-negotiable if husbands and wives expect to rule well on God's behalf in the earth to advance his kingdom and bring him glory. Remember, that's chapter one. In the words of Paul, if anyone is inclined to be contentious about God's divine order for the family, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God, 1 Corinthians eleven sixteen. 16. I covered that in an earlier video. Thus, if you still have a problem or issue with the big boss's divine order for the family, I suggest you take it up with him, beloved. Now, given all I've said, what do you think would happen to the Blue Angels and Delta Formation if all of a sudden the boss stopped following the big boss by refusing to operate within the boundaries and operating limitations of the big boss and his NATOPS manual? I'll tell you, the same thing that has happened in families all across America because family bosses are refusing to follow Christ and his word. First and foremost, we unknowingly get another leader, as stated earlier and in earlier videos. Secondly, wives and children are left without a spiritual leader to lead, protect, provide, and guide them in fulfilling God's mission for the family. 
Thirdly, wives and mothers are being forced into roles that they were never designed to have, resulting in chaos, confusion, bitterness, resentment, and every evil work. James 3.16. Welcome to the overwhelming majority of American families. That's right. While none of us could imagine the boss of the Blue Angels ever rejecting the big boss and his Natops manual to fly his own mission, leaving the Blues without his provision, protection, and guidance, men through passivity, ignorance, abdication of responsibility, abuse, neglect, misplaced priorities, rebellion, and abandonment are rejecting Jesus and his word every day to fly their own formations. Wives are not only left assuming a role that God never intended them to have, but raising a generation of kids who don't know the distinct roles dad, mom, and they play in the family formation because it was never modeled for them. The cumulative impact of this leadership vacuum over many generations has resulted in, in the unprecedented level of chaos we are experiencing in society today as family after family passes on the same destructive model that was modeled to them. Conversely, however, note what happens when men or bosses all across a nation appear together before the Lord God or big boss and submit themselves to his leadership and authority in every area of life as shown here in the following from Kingdom Man by Dr. Tony Evans. Here's the excerpt. God told the Israelites, as described in Exodus 34, 23, that three times a year, all their males were to appear together before him to receive instructions from him. Yet when God told them to appear, he specifically called them out before the Lord God of Israel. He called them to submit themselves to his complete authority. If the men submitted they were told that they and those connected to them would receive God's covering, protection, and provision. But they would receive this only if they positioned themselves under his absolute rule. Isn't that good? This is incidentally why so many men never get their flight plans from God's. Now we're back to me. They are unwilling to come before the Lord God and submit themselves to his complete authority. First, God says, in essence, no, no, you have it all backwards. Come before me first. Submit yourself to my complete authority first, and then I will give you instructions. To use a football illustration, when you coach are willing to come under the authority of the NFL rule book, I, the NFL commissioner, will allow you, coach, to have your own playbook. In other words, while every team must operate under the same rule book, the NFL commissioner gives every team the freedom to have their own playbook. God wants to give every man his own playbook, but he can't because we're unwilling to play by his rule book. The process begins when we're willing to come before the Lord thy God and submit to him. Now add to the above problem, primary wingmen or wives who refuse to submit to their bosses or husband's authority and follow him. And the number of bosses who take instructions from their wingmen instead of the big boss that runs contrary to God's instructions. Maybe then we will begin to understand the magnitude of the spiritual crisis we have in our nation. By the way, boss man, could all hell be breaking loose around you as it did for Adam because your primary wingman or wife just told you to eat the apple from the forbidden tree and you said, yes, dear, please tell me this isn't your idea of mutual submission. You see what happened in the spirit realm whenever Blue Angel number two decides that she wants to be the boss or that she will only follow the boss if he goes in her direction is that the big boss, Jesus, grounds the whole family formation. The same thing happens when the boss, husband or dad, decides he no longer wants to follow the big boss or Jesus. Maybe you're wondering why the whole family formation gets grounded when just one blue is out of order. Because when one blue is out of order, 
the entire formation is out of order. Like the Blue Angels, the family unit can no longer complete the mission that was given to the boss, husband and dad. <coughs> Let me say that again. Like the Blue Angels, the family unit can no longer complete the mission that was given to the boss, husband and dad by Jesus Christ. Any boss or dad who tolerates such open rebellion to continue by even just one blue is not flying God's flight plan. He's, he might as well be called the flight angel of the blue devils, since that's whose flight plan he's flying. Good luck with that air show on Judgment Day, boss man. Remember, when you and I are out of order with God and one another, we're not flying God's mission, no matter how happy we are or how much we read the Bible, pray, or go to church. Religious activity has never been nor will ever be a threat to Satan. However, I'm sure he finds it amusing, especially when many of us return to flying his mission and building his kingdom before we even leave the church parking lot. How about this scenario? What would you think or what do you think would happen if Blue Angel number two decided that Blue Angel number five should get to call the shot, set the pace and choose the direction for the family? What would never happen in a million years on the Blue Angels flight demonstration team is happening in Christian homes all across America in the name of love. What do I mean? Dads and moms, but mostly Christian moms because of their nurturing mother hen instincts that seek the happiness and well-being of her chickadees or elevating the needs, wants, and desires of her children above God's flight plan and his chain of command. Grounded. Sadly, many Christian women, once they have children, go into mommy mode and never come out. I experienced this personally. Instead of the family flight plan revolving around the expansion of God's kingdom and his glory, it revolves around the needs, wants, and desires of the children. What this means practically is, is if Johnny's soccer schedule or Brittany's dance schedule prevents the family from having dinner and family devotions together regularly, or there's no opportunity for a date night anymore, oh well, sorry honey, we'll be at dance practice again. There's some cold chicken in the fridge, see you later. Really? Really? Guess who the boss of this family is and guess who God is looking for, mister? Clue. The first answer is different than the second. Have I found you yet? No? Okay, let's try this one. What do you think would happen if Blue Angel number five or Blue Angel number six were permitted to authorize their own breakaways from the rest of the family formation whenever they wanted? Better yet, what if number two, mom, authorized their breakaway without ever consulting number one? After the big boss spiritually grounds the whole family formation and cancels all of the upcoming air shows because they're no longer operating his way, he will again come looking for the boss to see what he authorized. He will then come looking for you, lady, to see what, why you got out of your lane and invited chaos to your family formation and, more importantly, made the boss, your husband, and him, the big boss, Jesus, look bad. What if you're the boss, husband and dad, and one of the blues, your children, needed to be corrected and disciplined for a repeat flying offense, and Blue Angel number two, your wife, routinely undermined your role and told the Blues behind your back that you, number one, were the one that was out of line. Cringe. Need I even answer? Can you imagine a Blue Angel child ever going rogue on his boss, dad, and big boss Jesus without ever getting disciplined? No way. A good boss, just like Jesus, our big boss, disciplines those he loves. Why? So they will become holy. Every good leader knows that left to our own devices, rogue blues pose too high a risk to themselves and their entire family formation. Finally, what do you think would happen if the boss in Blue Angel number two allowed the rest of the blues to come and go as they please without any rules or limitations? After all, that's what a tolerant 
freedom loving family does that doesn't want to limit their lose freedom of expression right again good luck finding someone to attend that chaotic air show while comparing the Blue Angels and Delta Formation to our family formations is in no way a perfect illustration, I trust you can now see how or out of order we are and how far we are from God's standard and how easy it is for Satan to orchestrate the great role reversal with us so he can take over our homes. Yes, even Christian homes. Let me put it to you this way. If you don't care about reclaiming through your family what has been stolen by the devil in the earth, chapter one, then disregard God's chain of command. If you could care less about advancing God's kingdom and bringing him glory, then let your wife be the boss, mister. Usurp the authority of your husband, ma'am. Follow the other leader so you can live your best life now and be prepared to answer for it all on judgment day. Don't worry, I got my toes too. Make no mistake, our nation is in trouble because the family formation is in trouble. And our family formations are in trouble because many bosses and primary wingmen, husbands and wives have committed the great role reversal with God and one another showing a complete disregard for God and his word. And because many of us are out of order, our children and the culture are out of order. In summary, Satan can easily orchestrate the great role reversal with present and future generations of families inviting hell to take over our homes when we, one, don't know why we were created or what our purpose is from God's perspective, which we covered in the first video, don't know what our role is and isn't, which from God's perspective, which we covered in the first, which three videos don't know what our mate's role is and isn't from god's perspective covered in the first three videos four videos fly our own missions which is really satan's mission instead of flying god's mission outlined for us in his word covered in the first four videos operate outside of the boundaries and limitations of the big boss jesus and his word number six only follow the big boss jesus when we like the direction he is going elevate the parent child relationship above the husband wife relationship again all these covered in the first four videos Number eight, do not partner with our spouse to fulfill God's vision and purpose for the family. Number nine, do not train and equip our children to be the future bosses and primary wingmen of their own families. While it would be nice if all of our family formations operated like the Blue Angels to maximize our impact for the kingdom of God in every area of society, I clearly recognize that this is not possible for some of us. One reason is that we cannot control how others choose to fly in our family formations. I have this going on right now with my adult children. I get it. However, we can control how we're going to fly and what we are willing to accept and not accept from others. We can also wear appropriate, dispense appropriate consequences like God does with us for flight violations so others will get back in their lanes or decide against God and us. Additionally, we can humble ourselves and ask for forgiveness for not leading or following well where appropriate. While scripture commands us to forgive at all times and make allowances for faults, Colossians 3.13, annoyances and misdeeds, it does not command us to abdicate our responsibilities or make allowances for those who refuse to get back in their lanes. Additionally, it does not command us to trust those who cannot be trusted to stay in their lanes. Please allow me to be blunt as if I haven't been already. Since God will come looking for you and me first, sir, make sure if your family, God forbid, crashes, it's not crashing because you were unwilling to follow Christ and operate by the boundaries and limitations of his word. While doing the right thing doesn't guarantee that others will follow you and do the right thing, it certainly improves the odds.
But since God's love and eternal assurance in Christ are the only guarantees we have in life, build your life around these as you extend that love to others within the framework of his word and leave the consequences to God. This is what it means to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Matthew 6, And what I believe God is calling every man to, whether others follow them or not. The same goes for you, lady. Do not allow the sins of your boss or husband to be your excuse for promoting yourself to a position you were never created to have or entitled to assume, i.e. boss. If your husband is out of order, follow your big boss, Jesus, until your boss husband places himself back underneath the big boss's authority. However, the reality is your husband may not. While God commands you to respect your husband's position, whether he deserves it or not, you do not have to follow him if he's not following Christ, as I've said again and again and again. However, if your husband is following Christ, as I've said, though it may not be the way you like, you will be on the hook if you choose not to follow him and usurp his authority in any area of life. Therefore, if your family is going to crash, make sure, as previously stated with men, it's not crashing because you insist on being the boss through your actions, attitudes, or beliefs. While I try to hit the biggies, there are countless other ways Satan can get us to commit the great role reversal with God and one another, should the ones that I've highlighted fail to materialize. Be keenly aware of this. The good news is that we don't have to fear any of them as long as we stay in our lanes. Amen? So why is it such a struggle to stay in formation with God and one another? Simple. We want the glory. Just like Lucifer, and don't want to share it with anyone else, not even God. We, as a consequence of the fall, instinctively want to be the center of our worship and control others. Yes, even Christians, and the devil knows it. How does he know it? Because it's what he wanted, remember? Silently and internally, while the choice of our words might be different. While many of us, in essence, declare, if we were truly honest, is that nobody is going to tell me what to do, including God. I will be the center of my worship. And if you get in my way, you will feel my wrath. The only way out of this self-centered, demonically influenced hell that plagues all of us to varying degrees of submission to Christ and his word through the ongoing process of sanctification. Nobody has to worry about jockeying for positions in a family formation where every member of the family seeks to be under Christ's authority and is concerned about obeying and pleasing him. Amen. So tough questions. Honesty required. What do people see when they look at your family formation? Do they see a spiritual leader who, in spite of his sin, is constantly adjusting his life to follow Jesus Christ? Do they see a wife and mom who, in, despite her sin, is frequently adjusting her life to follow her husband as he follows Christ? Do they see children who, despite their sin, are continually adjusting their lives to follow dad and mom? Boss, I dare you to ask your wife, your kids, and other mature believers who know you well, not just casually, to truthfully tell you what they see when they look at your family formation. Wives, same thing. You might be surprised at what you hear. The real question, however, is if you don't like the answer, are you and I willing to do something about it? Knowledge alone never saved anything. You and I must take actions. Why it's called a walk and not a talk by faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Maybe some of you are saying this is all well and good for traditional family spence, but I'm a single parent. How does all this apply to me? Simple. If you're a single mom with your children living at home with you, Jesus is your boss and big boss. You're married to him. He's your leader and you are his primary wingman. If their father is still alive, he is their spiritual leader, not you. However, if he's out of his lane, your children don't have to follow him. 
While it may feel like you have to assume his position as a spiritual leader of the children because their father is no longer in the home, don't do this. Besides committing the great role reversal with your spiritual leader, Jesus, first and foremost, excuse me, you have just programmed yourself for future failure should you get married again. How? Simple. Because you've allowed yourself to function as the boss, you instinctively want to continue to be the boss, which just became your new husband's role if your children are living under his roof. Think about it. How easy do you think it's going to be for you to allow your new husband to function as the boss when you've been the boss all these years? Meanwhile, who's fulfilling the role of primary wingman? Not you. And if your new husband is, he's out of his lane. While you absolutely have a critical role to play in your biological children's spiritual training and development, whether single or married, you will never, by God's design, be their spiritual leader. To assume a role that doesn't belong to you is to tell God that he doesn't know what he's talking about. Not a good idea, sister. Guess who just became your biggest problem? Clue, not your new husband. If you teach your children that you, not your new husband, the spiritual leader or boss, other than what I've already said, you have just programmed their future families to be immediately hijacked by the devil. Why? Because your boys will grow up thinking it's normal to follow the women in their lives, and your girls will grow up thinking it's normal to be the leader instead of the follower. Have you looked around lately? Satan doesn't even have to show up to do his job in most cases because the current generation is already been programmed, has already programmed the next generation to do it for him. Yes, even in the church. And some of you thought the consequences of ordaining women as pastors and elders stopped at the front doors of your homes. Good luck with that one on Judgment Day to all the men in our churches and all across America who are allowing it. We operate by the rules of another kingdom, remember? This is one of the main reasons why so many blended families fail. The biological mom refuses to give the role of spiritual leader to her new husband because she said, look, these are my children. No, actually, precious sister, they belong to Jesus, the giver of life, therefore are subject to his spiritual hierarchy and ethics, as I covered in an earlier video. We say the same thing about our money and possessions, at least we should, that it all belongs to God, right? Somehow, we think this doesn't apply to children. While you, like Mary was with Christ, were handpicked by God to give birth to them and partner with Christ in the stewardship of their soul by training them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, our children exist for God's glory, not ours. God didn't give us children so we would all have lookalikes who simply become productive members of society as necessary as this is. He gave us children to replicate his image and glory worldwide, as you may re recall. Sadly, single moms who do not understand any of this unknowingly commit the great role reversal with God and their new husband on day one by assuming his role over her biological children. Easy day for Satan. If you're a single dad with your children living with you, you're still flying in the same position you were flying in before, just without a primary wingman. Jesus is your leader, not your co-pilot or primary wingman. If you have a daughter at home, this is an ideal time to train her on how to be the primary wingman for her future husband. Teach her her role and let her practice watching your back as one of your boys. If you have one, watch your back from the other side of the formation. They need to see you following Christ as they follow you. All the dynamics I've described are still in play. Despite not having a primary wingman, you as a family can still fly God's flight plan and fulfill his mission for you. I've been doing this for years. Don't let the devil convince you otherwise. Additional warnings to single parents and blended families. While everything I've said in this chapter applies to non-blended and blended families, I need you to know something vital if you're a single parent who desires to be married again. Ready? 
It's the same thing I want you to see if you're in a blended family now. While it should be obvious given what I've said already, I do not wish to assume anything given the schemes and strategies of the enemy. Ready? While the devil is flawlessly orchestrating the great role reversal over countless first-time marriages, non-blended families, it's even easier for him to do it in a blended family where stepchildren exist. Why? Two primary reasons. First, there's often great parental guilt over divorcing the child's other parent. Number two, there is an overwhelming desire to protect children from the future hurt also tied to guilt. Both of these realities, unless they're nailed to the cross and brought under God's authority, often result in that spouse being more loyal to his or her biological children than they are to their new spouse, especially when those two worlds collide. And trust me, they will collide. It's very easy for the devil to turn things upside down when guilt is driving decision-making and there is no shortage of it in blended families. Satan knows that. Now you do. Be very, very mindful of this. There is one, this is one of the major reasons why divorce statistics increase roughly 10% with each succeeding marriage. The good news is that if the devil tries the scheme on your blended family, you now know what it is and how to defeat it by getting back in your lane. Ladies, to eliminate all wiggle room for the devil to exploit you, please allow me to be very direct. If you have biological children from a previous marriage and you can't let your new husband be their spiritual leader under the roof where you and they will reside, you have no business getting married. It doesn't matter if you're their biological parent or not. God's role for your new husband also applies to stepchildren. We are all adopted children of God, are we not? In the same way that God doesn't distinguish between Jew and Gentile concerning his children, God doesn't differentiate between biological and stepchildren when it comes to your new husband's role as their spiritual leader of the family. Therefore, lady, if you have no intention of operating under God's divine order for your family, don't get married. If you do, your new husband, if he's truly a man, will occupy the position as a spiritual leader of your children, period. This means that in areas of disagreement, as long as he is not out of order, God expects you to yield to his spiritual authority in everything when it comes to your biological children. Read this again, pray precious one, or hear this again, precious one. Again, if you cannot do this while your children are living under your marital roof, do yourself, your man, your children, and most importantly, God and society a favor and do not get married. If you ignore this warning and do not recognize his position as your spiritual leader over you and your biological children, you have just invited Satan to take over your family. Single moms, have you ever heard Satan whisper, nobody loves your children like you. Your new husband is not going to protect them like you. After all the pain they've been through, they deserve to be happy. If you don't take the lead, he's going to abuse his position with your children. And where does that leave you then? You're the one in control. You, don't, you didn't need him before. You certainly don't need him now. Don't yield. You'll regret it and never get what you want. You know what's best for your kids, not him. You take the lead. Remember how your mother called the shots in your house when you were growing up? That's you. No man gets to call the shots when it comes to your children. If you have routinely heard thoughts like these that I just described as a single mom, then I would highly recommend you not get married as it's all but a guarantee that you and your new husband will become victims of the great role reversal. Stay single and raise your kids to love God and follow him as you complete his mission. No shame. In fact, it's a very high calling to be commended. If it's too late and you've already gotten married and are out of your lane, I strongly encourage you to seek your husband's forgiveness and assume your proper role today. Order your priorities around God first, your husband second, and your children third.
Ladies, God is not looking for selective obedience on the spiritual leadership issue with your biological children, depending on your mood, feelings, or your husband's tone of voice, choice of words, and or his facial expressions. God is looking for you to obey him because you love him and want to make the big boss, Jesus, look good. Remember? Please understand, ladies, that if your husband is not the spiritual leader of all, including your biological children, i.e. his stepchildren, he's not your spiritual leader at all. Did you catch that? The minute you elevate the parent-child relationship with your biological children above the husband-wife relationship out of fear, guilt, or for any other reason, your big boss, Jesus, just became your biggest problem. Single dads, I give you a similar warning. If you are considering marrying a woman who has children from a previous marriage, I urge you to do everything in your power through Christ to ensure that your future wife understands your role and hers concerning her children before you get married. This is why a long courting or dating period, one to two years, is critical. If there is any indication during this time that your future wife may have struggles allowing you to be the spiritual leader of her biological children, I would urge you not to marry her and to end the relationship immediately. If you don't, the odds are nearly 100% you will end up as a statistic of the great role reversal, whether divorce occurs or not. More importantly than that, however, is that you will never be able to rule your world under God's hand as one to fulfill the purpose for which you and she were created. Men, equally if you are not willing to assume the role of spiritual leader over your future stepchildren, don't get married. If you marry her and abdicate this responsibility to her to keep the peace in your home, you, like Adam, will have to answer to God for why you allowed the great role reversal to occur, especially since you knew better after hearing this. Similarly, Single dads, if you're going to be more loyal to your biological children than your new wife, you equally have no business getting married. Be honest with yourself and your future wife if you're in a, in a relationship like this and end it. Save yourself, her, and your children a lifetime of misery and regret that will surely come if you put your children in the number two position in the family formation and push your wife to the back of the formation. God will ground you, remember? I can hear some of you saying, I would never put my biological children ahead of my husband. That's the same thing my former wife and countless others say until real life situations arrive that involve that very choice. Remember, divided loyalty between a new spouse and biological children from a previous spouse over guilt you carry from the divorce from their other parent is a strong disobeyer. While divorce can be useful to advance Satan's kingdom and glory in the earth, Satan is equally happy to use families that have been grounded by God for flight violations to accomplish the same objective. In fact, it can be a very efficient use of his time when it can get the current generation of bosses and primary wingmen inside and outside of the church to train the next generation of bosses and primary wingmen inside and outside of the church on how to commit the great role reversal. Why? Because he doesn't even have to show up. We do his work for him. Have you looked around lately? Remember, precious one, a dead tree can stand in the forest for a long time. So can a dead marriage and a dead church for that matter. Therefore, make sure if your marriage is still standing, you're standing on the rock Christ Jesus and the reason for which God created it. Remember, the job of every boss and primary wingman is to make sure the big boss looks good. When it comes to submitting to God's divine order for the family, it is critical that we check our likes and dislikes at the door. Said another way, when our ways disagree with God's ways, he's always right and we're always wrong. Please also understand that the devil can orchestrate the great bow reversal 
He can't orchestrate it until he can get a husband or wife to accept one of his lies as their truth. The operative word is accept. That's why I wrote chapter six of Operation Heal America, the big lies that we believe. As long as we expose and reject his lie in the suggestion, consultation, or consideration phase, the great role reversal cannot occur. This requires, quote, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verses three through six. You see, lies start as imaginations. If the devil can get us, like Eve, to imagine how glorious things would be if we would just act independently of God and his word, he's got us. If he can get us to elevate high things, which are proud things he erects in our minds, above what God has already said on that matter, we're done. Ladies, you must realize as the weaker vessels that you are significantly more prone to being deceived by the devil and committing the great role reversal than your husband, all other things being equal, and the devil knows it. That's why many religious scholars and theologians believe Satan waited until Eve arrived on the scene before he came to Adam and Eve in the garden. While my discussion on the great bow reversal up to now has been intentionally confined to heterosexual marriages, I would be remiss in a chapter about bow reversals if I didn't discuss the other great bow reversal occurring in society today, gay marriage. Men and women are not only reversing roles in traditional families, but they're abandoning their roles altogether in the pursuit of homosexual unions and marriages. Have you ever considered, for example, that gay marriages can't operate in their God-ordained marital roles as God intended when the opposite sex does not even exist in a two-man or two-woman relationship? However, for gay marriage to allegedly work, according to them, one partner has to be the leader and the other has to be the follower. This means at least one of the partners are operating in a role that God never designed for them. I do find it fascinating, though not surprising, that some gay couples, however, understand the importance of order in the family better than some heterosexual couples as misplaced as it is. Now, for the record, I'm not a homophobe. In fact, I worked civil rights cases for the FBI, which included investigating hate crimes against gay individuals. I value all human life equally and know that God loves us all the same. However, when God what God has to say about a matter, i.e. the sin of homosexuality, differ, when it differs from what society and the courts have to say about the matter, I'm going with God every time. How about you, Christian? Now, where was I? We are now at the most important part of this video and one of the most crucial sections of the entire series. Up to now, I've discussed only some of the consequences of the great role reversal in marriage. I'd like to cover the rest of them right now for two reasons. First, so you would never forget them. And secondly, and more importantly, so you would never have to experience them. In this way, we can all get back to making the big boss look good. The list below comes from the excellent teachings of none other than Dr. Tony Evans, Christian author, speaker, senior pastor of Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship, president of the Urban Alternative, former chaplain in NFL Dallas Cowboys, and the longest standing chaplain of the NBA Dallas Mavericks, who incidentally I had the great honor and privilege of being with this past Sunday as you may have seen in some of my um, posts. Whenever husbands or wives commit what I've been referring to as the great role reversal in their marriage, the following devastating consequences occur until God's divine order is restored. One, listen to these, beloved. The husband and wife lose their ability to rule the world as one. Two, the marriage no longer functions underneath God's spiritual covering and authority. 
Three, Satan becomes our new leader, inviting hell to take over our homes. Four, God holds the out of order husband or wife in contempt of court. Five, God can no longer help or work for the marriage. Six, God stops participating in the marriage. Seven, God opposes the out of order spouse or spouses. Eight, the out of order spouse cancels God on his or her behalf. Nine, the marriage loses God's blessing because God will not operate in or bless chaos. 10, the marriage lives in the environment of a curse. Generation, or excuse me, Genesis 3, 17. If you are experiencing the great bow reversal right now, do not ignore, deny, minimize, rationalize, blame, or hide the fact that it's occurred. Get help now if you need it. There are a lot of marriages doing the work of the devil even Christian marriages, don't let yours be one of them. If you're stuck in an out-of-order marriage with someone who unrepentantly refuses to get back in their lane, my heart goes out to you. I know exactly how you feel. While this is where the devil wants you to stay so he can continue to call the shots in your family formation, it's not where God wants you to say to stay. Again, this is not an invitation for divorce, but it is a time for you and your mate to get some help. There's a big difference between righteous suffering, that is suffering for doing what is right as Christ did, and unrighteous suffering, which is suffering for doing what is wrong, unlike what Christ did. You may feel powerless to speak the truth and love to your mate and your desire to stand up for righteousness. In moments like these, it's critical that each of us ask ourselves the following questions. One, does Jesus want me to elevate man's divine order above God's divine order, which is idolatry? Two, what does this say about my heart. Three, is my unwillingness to do what is right, helping or hindering my spouse or me from becoming holy? Four, is this the kind of legacy I want to leave to those behind me after all Jesus has done for me? Finally, what will my judgment day look like if I refuse to stand up for righteousness in this hour and fail to fulfill God's vision and purpose and plan for my life? Chapter one. For those of you who say, have you ever considered that the great bow reversal may be God's will for my marriage? To this, I respond, how can you possibly read the list or hear the list of the 10 consequences above that I just cited for committing the great bow reversal and believe that any of them is God's will for you? While Satan would love for you to believe this and love for me to believe this, don't confuse consequences for sin with God's will, beloved. God's will is that we would not sin so that we would not have to bear the consequences of our sin. Secondly, go back and reread chapter one of Operation Heal America. You have already forgotten why you're here. How can you, how can we as a couple, if you're married, rule your world under God's hand to advance his kingdom and bring him glory when your marital unit refuses to operate under God's hand because one or both of you are out of your lanes? Again, please understand I'm not advocating divorce. I'm advocating obeying God and leaving the consequences to him. If you're the one who's out of your lane with no intentions of getting back into it, please know that going to church, praying, fasting, or being part of a Bible study is a total waste of time. If you don't believe me, take a look at what the Lord God said to the prophet Isaiah to the Israelites who, like you, were elevating their ways above God's ways, i.e. committing idolatry. Here it is. Here's the excerpt. Tell my people Israel of their sins, yet they act so pious. They come to the temple every day and seem delighted to hear my laws. You would think, you would almost think this was a righteous nation that would never abandon its God. They love to make a show of coming to me and asking me to take action on their behalf. Quote, we have fasted before you, they say. Why aren't you impressed? We have done much penance and, and you don't even notice it. I'll tell you why, says God. It's because you're living for yourselves even while you're fasting. You keep right on oppressing your workers. What good is fasting when you keep on fighting and quarreling? This kind of fasting will never get you anywhere with me. You humble yourselves by going through the motions of penance, bowing your heads like a blade of grass in the wind. 
you dress in sackcloth and cover yourselves with ashes. Is this what you call fasting? Do you really think this will please the Lord? Isaiah 58, 1 through 5. Similarly, recall the words of Samuel when he said the following. What is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is better than offering the fat of rams, 1 Samuel 15, 22. Now back to me. If you're the one causing the great role reversal, own it, repent, and go and sin no more. Now that you know the truth, you and I are now accountable to God to do something about it. Aren't you glad you heard this video and read the book? However, out of my great love for you and the church, you should also know that if you reject this truth and continue to operate out of your lane, you are completely out of God's will, and you will sadly and tragically experience all the consequences I've outlined if you haven't already. It is my earnest prayer that this would not have to happen to any of us and that we would humble ourselves, get back in our lanes, and receive the forgiveness and healing that God has for us. If, on the other hand, you are the one enabling or allowing the great role reversal to occur as Adam did, please understand that you are just as culpable for the loss of God's favor in your marriage as your spouse, and even more if you're the boss. Wise, if you are if you enable, rescue, or follow a husband who's out of order, you will bear the consequences outlined above. You are not loving him, serving him, or bringing glory to God if you do this. And may even be placing yourself and your children in danger. If this is you, I urge you to get help now. In his 40-plus years of counseling married couple, as a senior pastor of Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship, Dr. Tony Evans says the one common denominator that every married couple he counsels has is that one or both spouses are out of their lane. The only marriages that received healing were those where the spouse or spouses who were out of their lanes got back in their lanes. Wow, right? The Bible says that he who sows to the flesh shall the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the spirit shall the spirit reap everlasting life. Galatians 6, 8, 9. This principle holds true not only for the one who is causing the great role reversal to occur like Eve, but also to the one who is allowing the great role reversal to occur like Adam. In other words, whether we are sowing seeds of activity or causing or sowing seeds of activity that cause the great bow reversal to occur, like Eve, or sowing seeds of inactivity that allow the great bow reversal to occur, like Adam, we will reap the devastating consequences of the great bow reversal. You must know, while many Christians know, when they're out of their lanes, many do not. And because most of us don't look to fix something that isn't broken, at least in our minds, the most serious out-of-order scenario is when an out-of-order husband or wife genuinely believes that they're in their lanes when they're not. Spiritual blindness is a form of bondage. Think about it. If the devil can, is slick enough to convince a spouse that they're in their lane when they're not, how hard do you think it is for him to convince us that everything is all good when it's not? Maybe you're saying, great, but what do I do if my mate has committed the great role reversal and he or she refuses to get back in their lane? Great question. Shine a brighter light on the problem by bringing other witnesses into the situation as I outlined in Matthew 18, as is outlined in Matthew 18, 15 through 17. While this is a familiar passage of scripture to most, Christians seldom use it in the context of marital conflict. It is Jesus' instructions to us on how to deal with a brother or sister which includes a Christian spouse who has sinned against us. See it for yourself. Here it is. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained a brother. But if you will not, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses to hear but if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen or a tax collector. Again, Matthew 18, 15 through 17. Sadly, however, few husbands, wives, friends, family members, and church leaders are willing to apply the scripture to marriages and exercise church discipline like this where appropriate for reasons I will discuss 
later in another video. For now, however, it suffices to say that none of them are good. As we come to the close of this segment on the great role reversal, maybe you realize you've committed the great role reversal with God as an individual, with your spouse and God if you're married. If you're prepared to get some help, please allow me to be the first to congratulate you. Your life and marriage now have a chance of being everything God intended. Excuse me. Additionally, you have selfishly, excuse me, you have unselfishly made our nation that much stronger. More importantly, by agreeing to do life on God's terms and not your own, God is no longer opposing you and the devil is no longer ruling you. Your marriage is now able to build God's kingdom for his glory. However, the fight for your life and home has just begun. The good news is that you and I have the victory in Christ Jesus, and the devil knows it. He just doesn't want you to know it. Well, too late for that. Please remember, no matter what you're going through, precious one, God always gives greater grace, James 4, 6. For those married, even if your mate, Sally, doesn't want to assume his or her biblical role, you can assume yours. While your marriage may be grounded, you're not individually grounded. Do not allow your spouse's disobedience to be an excuse for your disobedience. After all, your obedience may be the very catalyst God uses to call your mate to get back in their lane. But then again, it may not. 1 Corinthians 7, 16. Contrary to all the bad Christian counseling out there that guarantees it will. Nevertheless, let your obedience either drive them to you and God or away from you and God. In this way, they are the ones deciding against you and God, not the other way around. Though you are still a house divided in your marriage, you're no longer part of the problem. More importantly, however, God is no longer your biggest problem. Husbands, God would never ask you to forsake his truth or divine order as a way to demonstrate love for your wife. This is not how Jesus loves the church. Contrary, it was Jesus' submission to the Father's will against his disciples' desire, I might add, that led to the greatest demonstration of love the world has ever known. Similarly, wives, you cannot place yourself underneath the authority of your husband in every area of life until you first placed yourself underneath the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ in every area of life, Ephesians 5.22. The same is true of you, single Christian lady who desires a husband one day. Until you're willing to do this, do yourself, your future mate, society, and God a favor, don't get married. Additionally, husbands and wives, God would never ask you to elevate your or your spouse's chain of command above God's chain of command to save your marriage. That's not only bad theology, it's idolatry. As you may have guessed, the 10 devastating consequences, the great role reversal of outline that I outlined earlier, are not only confined to marriage, they apply to every institution in America from our house to the White House. In the case of churches, the consequences of the great role reversal would apply to a pastor, for example, who is not shepherding his flock under God's authority. Maybe it's because he's engaging in false teaching, or perhaps it's because he's allowing his sheep to lead the church where they want to go instead of him leading the church where God has instructed him to go. Maybe it's because your church allows women to hold the office of senior pastor, senior pastors in the case of a husband, wife co-pastoral team, pastor, associate pastor, or elder in violation of scriptures like 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 14, 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 13, Titus 1, 5 through 9, 1 Peter 5, 1 to 4, and Acts 6, 1 to 6. Did you just hear plates crashing? By the way, what other outdated or no longer applicable New Testament verses have some of you conveniently kicked to the curb because they're no longer politically correct? 
Or maybe you're concerned about the effect they could have on tithing and God forbid your church growth if you don't know, if you don't kowtow to the culture. I've heard all the spiritual mumbo jumbo. And for those of you who wish to wrongly judge me as a chauvinist or misogynist to justify your rebellion to God's word, good luck with that on judgment day. I also wish you luck with the many superb female FBI agents and federal prosecutors I've had the pleasure of working with and under in some cases during my career. I don't recommend getting on their bad side. The workplace is not a divine institution, beloved. However, the home and church are. Now, where was I? Oh, yeah. Maybe the church is out of order because the senior leadership of the church is really only interested in building or preserving their kingdoms or because church leadership is continually and unrepentantly making allowances for evil because they want to be embraced by the culture. The result is the same. Out of order churches are now being transformed by an out of order culture. Instead of God's priorities being God, family, church, then work, ministry, many pastors, because their ministry and occupation are the same, make their first priority all three, God, church, and the ministry all wrapped in one, and then family, when it should be God, family, and then the church. This is the great challenge for every pastor and why it is so easy for the de devil to get pastors upside down without them even knowing it, subjecting themselves, their families, and their flock to fall out from the consequences of committing the great role reversal against God and others. If we can't get it right at home and in our churches, how can we expect our community, city, states, and government, and nation get to get it right? Simple, we can't. You see, our nation is upside down morally, socially, and spiritually because many of our homes and churches are upside down. Elected officials at every level of government, for example, have through demonic influence orchestrated the great role reversal with God himself by elevating themselves, their priorities, and their party politics above God and his word. Instead of us being one nation under God, we become one nation, in many cases, who thinks we're above God. What many of us don't realize, however, is that God will share his glory with no one, including those inside the beltway who think they know more than God when it comes to things like gay marriage, taxpayer-funded LGBTQ plus education, the Equality Act, abortion, harvesting baby parts for profit, and open borders. And poppycock to those of you who claim to be Christians inside the beltway and have the spineless arrogance to push these off as state matters and not voice your opposition out of fear of how your constituents, constituents might perceive you. Step up or resign. These are not state matters, friends. These are God matters. And guess who God is going to hold accountable at every level of government for making sure they stay God matters? Every Christian who holds a position in government and at every level of government and every Christian voter in America who had the ability to make these God matters in the office they held or hold or in the voting booth, but didn't. Real Christians obey the laws of the land unless those laws run contrary to the word of God, i.e. gay marriage, abortion, etc. Selah. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, Philippians 2, 10 and 11. We can do it now with actions that show this is true in the offices we hold, or we can do it later when one day it'll be too late. But one thing is for sure, we're going to do it, all of us. And if you've never heard this before, take this as your official warning from God through me to you. No, we are not behaving as one nation under God, but as one nation that thinks it's above God and is somehow exempt from the consequences of committing idolatry against God. Do not be deceived. God will not be mocked for whatsoever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will, all, will also of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. Galatians 6, 7 and 8. Haven't we reaped enough chaos and corruption from our house to the White House? 
Thus, God not only grounds individuals, marriages, families, and churches that commit the great role reversal by getting out of their lanes, but also entire cities, states, and nations. Look now, if you will, at the same 10 consequences I covered earlier that have been modified for America to show what happens to any nation like ours that commits the great role reversal with God. In other words, when this nation, America, commits the great role reversal with the Lord God, the following devastating consequences will occur until God's divine order is restored. One, America loses its ability to rule, that is to exercise godly rulership and dominion over its sovereign territory within its sovereign boundaries. Two, America no longer operates under God's spiritual covering and authority. Three, Satan becomes America's leader, causing hell to take over our nation. Four, God holds the out-of-order nation, America, in contempt of court. Five, God can't help or work for America. Six, God stops participating with America. Seven, God opposes America. Eight, the out-of-order nation, America, cancels God on their behalf. Nine, America loses God's blessing because God will not bless chaos. Ten, America lives in the environment of a curse. Have you looked around lately? If this doesn't motivate us to repent and get back in our lanes, nothing will, beloved. As a retired military veteran and public servant in this great country for nearly 36 years, I, like many of you, am proud to be an American. However, I'm not proud that this nation has elevated man's laws, in many cases, above God's law. Additionally, I'm not proud that we have elevated man's ways above God's ways and man's worship of country, flag and its founding documents above man's worship of God, the cross, and God's family or pardon me, God's founding document, the Holy Bible. I'm not proud that our nation, allegedly founded on Judeo-Christian values, has kicked Jesus Christ and his word out of every conceivable institution in America, from our house to the White House, with some of these so-called Christians jam a, a radical far-left agenda down the throats of American people. Please, if you're going to gain power and enrich yourselves at the expense of those you swore to represent, at least have the decency to leave God out of your rousing, hypocritical speeches that you arrogantly conclude with God bless America. If you remember no nothing else from these videos and the book, Operation Heal America, remember this. As I stated earlier, the fundamental problem with our lives and every institution in America we comprise from our house to the White House comes down to one question. Whose word will be final? Will God's word have the final word? Or will the Supreme Court? Our political party, pollsters, professional athletes, pop culture, social media, Hollywood, friends, or fill in the blank have the final word. Satan wants to know. Jesus already does. Please understand when it comes to committing the great bow reversal at any level in society, we're talking about characteristic behavior, right? All of us get out of our lanes from time to time. The Bible says the godly may trip seven times, but will get up again, get back in their lanes. But one disaster is enough to overthrow the wicked, Proverbs 24, 16. Why? Because the wicked refuse to get up and get back in their lanes. All of us have moments when we do not submit to God's authority. The question is, what are we characterized by individually and as the people of God, as a nation? But more importantly than that, what do we do when we find ourselves out of our lanes? Do we man up, take ownership, and get back in our lanes, or do we refuse, which is rebellion, or deny, which is spiritual blindness, that we're even out of our lanes? We cannot expect our nation to get back in its lane under God, right? One nation under God, supposedly, right? Until we, God's people, in every institution in America, from our house to the White House, get back in our lanes. Can you imagine how different our homes, churches, cities, states, and nation would be if the 80% of us who profess to be Christians would get back in our lanes to become one nation that is truly 
under God in every area of life. You know what I love most about this video? Knowing the devil absolutely hates it. He is absolutely furious that you and I know, now know about the great role reversal. Please do not let it go to waste. Share it with as many people as you can, your family, your church, community, small group, men's group, ladies group, and Bible study. So we, by God's grace, can all receive the healing that God has for us and give him all the glory. For those of you who just decide to do life, family, and church God's way, you have not only dealt a death blow to Satan and the power of the great role reversal in your life, your family, and your church, but you gave Jesus Christ and this nation the greatest gift possible, your heart. To celebrate your decision, I give to you the below revised version of the Blue Angel Creed written especially for you. Today is an amazing and memorable day in your life and the life of your family that will remain with you forever. You have agreed to take the narrow road in a world that is content to take the wide road because you wear his name. The humble privilege of being a child of God in this, your new family formation, carries with it an extraordinary honor, privilege, and responsibility. One that reflects not only on you as an individual, but on the rest of your family and the entire family of God around the world. To you who seek to follow Christ and are willing to make that sacrifice, you are the truest of heroes. The kingdom of God and its king, Jesus, applaud you. You bring encouragement, hope, and a promise for tomorrow's families and churches in the smiles and handshakes of those who look to you to show them the way of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Remember today as the day you committed yourselves to following Jesus, his way, and in accordance with his word. Look around at the rest of your family and church and commit this special bond to memory. Once a follower of Jesus Christ, always a follower of Jesus Christ rings true for all who proudly wear his name and are willing to follow him to the ends of the earth. Welcome to the family. Now at this time, I'd like to offer us a prayer of repentance, which is a direct quote from my book that I just want to cover in this video. If you would please bow your heads and close your eyes. I'm just going to share it with you, and I pray that it, it blesses you and convicts all of us. Let's do this. Lord Jesus, I confess I've been out of order and out of my lane with you and my spouse. In doing so, I've forsaken you as my leader and invited Satan to take over my home. I have allowed my words and others' words to have the final word in every aspect of my life. I recognize that in doing this, I have advanced Satan's kingdom in the earth instead of yours, contributing to the cultural chaos around us. I repent first and foremost for sinning against you, and secondly, for sinning against my spouse, children, church, city, state, and nation where applicable. At this time, I turn from my prideful and self-centered way of operating to align myself behind and underneath you, my spouse, for the merry ladies and your word in this most crucial area of life where my spouse, whether my spouse gets back in their lane or not, grant me the courage to humble myself and ask those where appropriate to forgive me for committing the great role reversal. I now willingly choose to get in my lane and assume my proper role within the family formation as you design. Help me from this day forward to stay in my lane and never again elevate my divine order above your divine order committing idolatry against you. Thank you for your steadfast love and mercy toward me that never cease and are new every morning and for standing more prepared to forgive my sins than I am to commit them and more willing to supply my needs than I am to confess them. May my family formation great, bring you great honor and glory from this day forward as I seek to follow you and operate within the boundaries and limitations of your word to advance your kingdom and bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name, 
Amen and amen. Well, beloved brothers and sisters, this concludes our teaching on the great role reversal. I pray it has blessed you again. I would encourage you to go back and listen to the earlier four videos and then listen to this one again to solidify this in this entire teaching and may it bless you and your family and your church and every institution in America from our house to the White House going forward. Next time I'm going to cover what this thing is called a covenant. Uh, the title of the next video segment like the title in, in Operation Heal America is whose covenant is it anyway? We're going to look at conditional and unconditional covenants and when God allows for the proper and biblical breakage of a covenant. Pastors, again, friendly reminder, if you're just connecting with us, go to the website, OperationHealAmerica.com, where you'll find all my social icons. Review all the YouTube video content, review the content on the website, shoot me a question, uh, shoot me a, a a message, and I'll send you a free copy of the book. Register at the website. The cost is free. And connect with us so we can literally make his story together. God bless you all. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he be gracious to you and lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. We'll see you next time. God bless everybody.